Truth and Reconciliation Day is Canada's newest holiday. Starting in 2021, September 30th shall be marked as a day of remembrance to survivors of residential schools and Indigenous Canadian awareness in general. For its inaugural year, I thought I would take a look at some lesser-known Indigenous Western Canadian history. The final war between the Iron Confederacy and the Blackfoot Confederacy. Let's dive in. In this video, I'll be using the names of various Indigenous Canadian nations in their own language to the best of my abilities. The only time I'll be using the English names is when describing the Iron and Blackfoot Confederacies and the leaders within them. So for the Cree, I will be using the name Nihiwuk, for the Blackfoot, Siksika, for the Blood, Gaina, for the Pagan, Pikani, and for the Assiniboine, Nakoda. The flags I'm using are of modern creation. The Iron Confederacy was a political and military partnership between what was described by the English as the Young Dogs. This was a mixing of Nehewuk and Nakoda Nation, with a few Ojibwe nationals joining for security in present-day Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Their nation originally stretched from Quebec up to Alberta, but their territory had been reduced significantly by European colonial wars, as well as bison extinction. This caused a westward push to gain livable land and a stable way of life away from the traders, prospectors, and settlers. This would put them in direct conflict with the other indigenous nations. The Blackfoot Confederacy consisted of Siksika, Gaina, and Pikani nations. Much like the Iron Confederacy, this was a political and military partnership to preserve their culture and borders. Traditionally, their land claims were much smaller than the Iron, it comprised of a large portion of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and a small bit of British Columbia. While their borders were mostly unaffected by European settlement, American Manifest Destiny had led to a war and eventual genocide in Montana that saw the Blackfoot Confederacy lose all but a small chunk south of the Canadian border. Add to that a smallpox epidemic that decimated the population for almost two decades, and you have a recipe for a swift decline in destruction. However, somehow the Blackfoot held strong. By the 1860s, the Blackfoot Confederacy was beset on every front. Internally, they were fighting the start of the aforementioned smallpox epidemic that killed without prejudice, while externally they were fighting prospectors, Hudson's Bay traders, and influential wolf hunters called wolfers that were encroaching on their territory. European, Métis, and Nehewuk nationals tested their luck as they pushed past the Siksika's borders with no regard and little resistance. All of that was the prelude to the real push, the signing over of Rupert's land. The deal struck by Canada and the Hudson's Bay Company in 1869 was seen as the final death certificate to the Iron and Blackfoot Confederacy's collective existence. Now the colonists would come in droves, and they would have soldiers following them to police the prairies. With the buffalo pushed to extinction in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and therefore no longer a consistent source of protein outside of the Siksika territory, the nations of the Iron Confederacy were keen to occupy Pikani land. The leader, Piapot, set his sights on Cypress Hills in southern Saskatchewan and Alberta. The Pikani had built a winter camp at the Milk River Delta near Writing on Stone. They had plentiful food, fuel, and clothing stores to outlast the harsh prairie winter and had a fresh source of water at the river's edge. Just over the Sweetgrass Hills lay a similar wintering camp of the Nehewuk and Nakoda Nationals. The Nehewuk concocted a battle plan to raid the Pikani camp and procure provisions. They formed two flanking positions and hit the Pikani camp. The defenders were caught mostly off guard, but still managed to repel the attacking skirmishers. The Iron Confederacy soldiers fled, but were cut down by the Pikani riflemen as they tried to escape to cover uphill. An estimated 20 Pikani and 300 Nehewuk were killed in the battle. While the battle has no official name, it was known to the Blackfoot Confederacy as the Retreat Uphill. The Iron Confederacy was resolute. For four years, they probed the Siksika's defenses, sending scouting party after scouting party. Finally, by 1870, the Iron leaders figured they had a chance. The Nehewuk began to muster at their position outside of current-day Swift Current, Saskatchewan. They put out a call of action to their allies across the nation of the Iron Confederacy that war was inevitable if they were to survive the westward colonialism and dwindling bison population. 
Pia Pot had become the leader of the Iron Confederacy by 1860, and as previously mentioned, pushed for rapid advances in his military and the annexation of the Cypress Hills to secure a source of bison. The Blackfoot Confederacy had just recently lost most of their territory in Montana in January of 1870. The refugees shored up at a camp with their fellow Gaina allies to regroup at Belly River. This increased the population density and worsened the still active smallpox epidemic, ravaging the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Iron Confederacy saw its chance to strike and rode off to present-day Lethbridge, Alberta. The five or six hundred strong Iron Force would come upon a Gaina camp sitting along the Belly River outside what would be modern-day Lethbridge. Using the topography and the darkness of the night to their advantage, they stationed their horses in the ravines while their riflemen climbed to the top of the coolies to take pot shots at the Blackfoot Confederacy's northernmost camp. Seeing a few fighting back, the Iron Confederacy tried to press their advantage and take the camp, but the residents weren't budging. Scouts were sent to the south camp to request reinforcements. Four hours in, and the riders from the south finally reached the beleaguered northern camp. Upon reaching the battle site, the Siksika Dragoons bashed into the side of the Iron Confederacy skirmish line, scattering the riflemen and forcing a rout. The Iron Skirmishers ran back to the ravines where they had started, but it served no respite. The Blackfoot Confederacy's cavalry showed no quarter and chased their enemy right to the river's edge. As the fleeing Nehaewuk tried to swim across to safety, the Gaina massacred them. A Métis trader named Jerry Potts was in charge of one of the fighting columns. His description of the retreat goes as follows. You could fire with your eyes shut, and you would be sure to kill a Cree. The few that made it across the river were not out of harm's way. The Blackfoot cavalry pursued them into the open plains where they cut down any Nahayawak left standing. Eventually, the fleeing soldiers found refuge in a wooded area and found shelter in the nearby Galt ore mine. The battle was over. Eyewitnesses described the total carnage as sickening. When attempting to count and bury the Iron Confederacy casualties, the numbers were so large that most were left to just sink in the now blood-colored Belly River. Of the supposed 600 warriors, the Irons lost 3 to 350 men. When the news hit Piapot, he immediately sent out Tobacco to Crowfoot, the leader of the Siksika, as an offering to show his forces quarter. By 1871, a formal peace treaty was signed between the two men. The battle has been mythologized by the people of southern Alberta, indigenous or otherwise. It was the last well-documented, large-scale battle between two indigenous nations, and one with the most observers. The victory is also curiously studied. How did such a large force of attackers with the element of surprise get routed so completely? Was it the superiority of cavalry and the dragoon-style flexibility? Perhaps it was the difference in technology. The Blackfoot Confederacy was said to have newer breech-loading weapons and repeating rifles, revolvers, and even Franco-Prussian needle guns. While the Iron Confederacy used mostly old Hudson Bay surplus muskets, bows and arrows, with a few modern guns inside the force. Or could it have been the veterans of the American wars against the Pecani in Montana using their knowledge that made all the difference? Regardless, the battle ended a long-standing aggression the Confederacies had for each other, and the beginning of the end of their way of life as nomadic hunters. The bison were driven from the plains and the westward expansion, while temporarily halted by Louis Riel and his Nehawak allies during the Northwest Rebellion, couldn't be stopped. The Iron Confederacy dissolved and the Nehawak and Nakoda went their separate ways. The Blackfoot Confederacy decided to stay out of the rebellion and very much exist to this day. While they only have a fraction of their original ancestral land, they can say they have not been uprooted from their nation for over 400 years. Thanks for watching.